start here. Uh, tell me the person that, that you were before all this happened in, in 1991, the, the young man that you were in North Philly. So in 1991, I was a singer, songwriter, musician. I had an up and coming group uh, called Sensation. We were receiving um, interest from music executives and record labels. And I was a father to uh, a beautiful three and a half year old, my oldest daughter, and I had a young daughter on the way. I was a friend, I was a son, I was a brother. Um, if you would have met me back then, you would have said, this guy is happy-go-lucky and he knows what he wants out of life and he knows where he's going. That's who I was. So I remember the story of a 17-year-old girl in Philly is it Chadell? Chadell Williams? Is yes. that correct? Yes, that's I remember this. I remember this story. I mean, I was in Philly at the time, and uh, she's killed. Was it over her earrings? Do I have that correct? Yes. Yes, yes it was. A, this was a famous part. story in Philadelphia. This was yeah. a, a, really, a really big yeah. deal. Yeah, it was a high-profile case, yeah. Absolutely. And this was a time they were telling folks, don't wear, you know, gold earrings. You know, you never mm -hmm. know what's going to happen. Yeah. And three three people right. claim that you you killed this 17 year old girl you weren't anywhere in the you know anywhere at the scene there's no connection there's nothing but three random people just say you're the murderer tell us what happened so um the police uh actually went about uh scouring across the city of philadelphia and um I had a, uh, these three witnesses who you speak of, they never gave positive identification. So what people have to understand is, even though they gave tentative uh, identifications, when they was asked, can you be sure? They said, no, you can read all the statements and all the documents. They emphatically said no, but the police needed a scapegoat and somebody to hang out to drive and they chose me and I didn't fit the physical description. So if you can imagine the perpetrator, there's supposed to be three perpetrators, but I was the only one ever uh, stolen away. Um, they said that the perpetrator was supposed to be 5'10", to six feet tall, 200 pounds and dark skin complexion. So when I say dark skin complexion, um, if your audience can imagine, you're talking about um, Wesley Snipes the famous actor, that's dark skin complexion. You're talking about Miles Davis, um, the famous jazz musician. I, I stand five foot four, I weigh a diminutive 125 pounds. And as you can see, I'm brown skin complexion. And the crime took place in a matter of seconds. So this is something that clearly um, destroyed my life and destroyed the lives of two families as well. And I, I want to make sure folks really, really got that. The the height is 5'10 to 6'1. You're 5'4. I'm 5'4. I mean, this, this is insane. This is right. absolutely insane. So why did these three people uh, say that you did this? I mean, I heard there was some jealousy there. Like, what, what was the reason why they said it was you? Well, in terms of the... Uh, three eyewitnesses, um, they simply just made a mistake. But once somebody says um, they can't be sure about something and they say no, that should be it. I shouldn't have been arrested. But these police officers, uh, Jaskrimski and Santiago and the corrupt district attorney, all these three people were corrupt. Roger King, the district attorney, these two police officers, uh, Jaskrimski and Santiago, who have been proven to be corrupt in this case and have been proven to be corrupt in a multitude of cases around this city, including Anthony Wright, who y'all are aware of, um, that won a, a lawsuit against the city of Philadelphia um, just a couple of years ago. These police officers did this to 29 other people. I'm just the most egregious case that they put on death row. So it's easy to uh, for police officers to persuade and get people to lie and to sort of um, fit their narrative. And there's a lot of corruption 
in this case, when you read the legal opinion of August 21st, 2013, by the Honorable Judge Anita Brody, she lays out the, con the corruption in a 43-page scathing opinion, legal opinion. And from the first paragraph of that page, all you have to do is look up that legal opinion. The first thing out of her mouth is James A. Dennis was wrongfully convicted for a crime that he did not commit. And then you go to the Third Circuit uh, opinion, which is the highest court in Pennsylvania, and they said that this is a grave miscarriage of justice in a, in a legal decision that is now president in this country, which helps uh, other innocent people uh, come home, I might add. And you said a name here, and I've talked about this person before on my show several times. Roger King. We interviewed Chester Holman uh, a few weeks ago. Roger mm -hmm. King was a black prosecutor, and he was famous. He was infamous for locking up as many black folks as possible. I mean, this man was just infamous for what he did, being this black prosecutor, doing this to other people who looked like him. I mean, it really is a, a sad, sad, sad situation. Uh, as you're in this trial, as a young man, how old were you at the time? I was 21 and I just uh, had turned, I was uh, 21 when I was arrested and I just turned 22. So as you're, you're a 21 year old, you're 22 years old, you're in this trial and you're just hearing all these, you know you're innocent, you're hearing all these things against you. How are you feeling? What are you, what are you going through? I was literally um, devastated. Uh, my entire world was uh, rocked. If you can imagine, you go from feeling like everything is about to blossom and bloom in your li life and everything is coming together with the music, with my family. And then I'm sitting in a trial and all I'm hearing is lie after lie by Roger King and these police officers. And to this very day, I still have nightmares uh, and I wake up in cold sweats of reliving uh, the trial and everything that has happened to me. Um, and listen, when the tears would roll down my eyes as I was being lied on, the media back then didn't cover it. They wouldn't say anything about it, you know? Um, I was literally devastated and my world was rocked. It just felt like Somebody had took a needle and took all the life out of me, took all the air out of me. Did it, you know, I was talking to Chester Holman about this. Uh, Roger King basically ruins his life. Then later there was another judge, a black woman judge, who also said the uh, sentence must stand. I'm just wondering, when you're seeing this, this black prosecutor do this to you, are you thinking, are you feeling at this time, like, wow, this is another black man doing this to me? Like, isn't he going to be able to see it? See, the truth of the matter is, is, is that, you know, I don't know what most people would tell you, but most people, we need to start to have honest conversations, right? And what I mean by that is we need to say how we feel and not worry about what people are going to think um, because we've been through such a horrific ordeal. And that's everybody in the innocent community all my brothers. When I came to understand and know that Roger King had did this to me, Chester Hoffman, uh, William Niaz, and so many other men and women who during my studying of uh, law, I started to realize that this was indeed a corrupt prosecutor um, nobody in this city should look at him um, with anything except for ridicule and scorn for what he did to me, Chester Hoffman, William Niaz, and many others. Um, another man just came home by the name of Orlando uh, Manasek uh, a couple of years ago. Um, there's countless stories, but to put me on death row and to take my and to try to kill me, and then I had to survive two execution warrants. My family was literally devastated. What I thought about him was, I'm looking and what I come to know is somebody as an evil man. Even when you watch 
the Innocent Files on Chester Hoffman. And they talk about me in that episode. And people have to understand this man crossed every single line. He, he hid evidence of my, and him and the police officers that I mentioned, Descripsy and Santiago, destroyed or hid evidence of my innocence, meaning evidence of other people confessing to the crime, uh, evidence of DNA evidence that would have exonerated me, uh, homicide files and bonders that have disappeared, um, never to be seen again, and then get on a witness stand and actually lie to people about it, yet and still, only to have me still stay in prison for multitude of years. These are truly evil people and um, the city should recognize each case as such and the FBI in the city should do an audit of all the Roger King cases need to be audited and re uh, looked into again. And everybody uh, should have a fair uh, trial in those cases, all his cases should be reinvestigated and looked over again, starting with a case by the name, a uh, 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 innocent man on death row uh, right now by the name of Ralph Stokes, who, who has spent over 30 years um, in prison. And until we get to the point where we have honest conversations and say that police officers and district attorneys need to be prosecuted and locked up when they send innocent people like me, Chester Hoffman, Anthony Wright, mm -hmm. and so many others to prison, stuff like this isn't going to stop. You just seen earlier this week that another innocent man came home mm -hmm. after serving 25 some odd years in prison. This is an epidemic. And listen, uh, for those who don't know, Roger King has since passed away. And the city of Philadelphia still acts like he's a hero. They, they, they've, never, they've never atoned. They've never... Uh, spoke the truth about him. Uh, it's really just disgusting. This man died uh, a hero via, via lies, Roger King. So you're on death row, and um, it's one thing to be behind bars, but it's one thing to be on death row. Uh, tell us, for those that don't know, uh, the experience of death row. I read one report that the guards tried to set your cell on fire. So not only are you dealing with inmates, you're dealing with guards who are treating you inhumane. Tell us about the experience of death row. Well, it was it was prisoners, but the guards and the prisoners were always trying to kill me. I was jumped. I was uh, set up uh, uh, constantly uh, jumped and I had to defend myself. I actually lost 30% of my hearing in prison from the physical uh, attacks. I have teeth in my mouth that have literally been knocked out on the side and so on and so forth um, from being hit with soap and batteries being jumped um, by prisoners and uh, guards um, setting it up. So um, from the moment I stepped foot in the county prison, all this was taking place. And so much so that a lot of times um, after many different attacks, um, uh, my head was on a swivel. And then when I went to death row, the things I experienced on death row. Death row is a day-to-day -day assault on a human spirit. That's what death row is. And for me, it was literally like somebody held a gun to my head every single day and was playing Russian roulette. That's how death row was for me. You're dealing with racist and prejudiced guards. You're dealing with prisoners who have multiple personalities and different psychosis from being under the worst conditions. Your light stays on 24 hours a day. You, you never sleep in darkness. So if you know what that can do to your vision and your mental state and your Wait, spirit. I'm sorry, Mr. I'm sorry. The, yeah. the light in your cell never turns off? No, it does not. Oh my not on God. death row. It does not. So that's you're dealing torture. with sleep. That's right. So you're dealing with sleep deprivation, deprivation you're dealing with all type kind of psychosis with your eyes and all mental psychosis. And you're dealing with a lot of different health issues that come about. The trays, the trays in prison do not have plastic inserts. So they are the most filthiest trays that you ever could try to um, eat off. You'll see breakfast, lunch, and lunch meals on 
a dinner tray because they haven't been properly cleaned. You'll, you'll see racial epithets and prejudice epithet toward prisoners on death row. You'll have the guards. You can check the temperature and know what your day is going to be like from what guard is going to be working. You'll get burnt, as they call it, getting burnt for the yard uh, or, or shower or a phone call to your loved one. You only have 15 minutes to use the phone. So death row is a horrific ordeal. And as I often told people, it's something to be in prison, but it's something different to be in prison when you're innocent like I was and your life has been stolen away for something you didn't do and your family is suffering and you have two little girls uh, that you want to take care of and you have a, a mother that you want to take care of and you have a father that you want to take care of and then their health has um, uh, deteriorated um, because you're in prison for something you didn't do. One of the things that was uh, happening to me is that my father had a stroke as soon as he knew that uh, Roger King and these corrupt police officers were taking me to trial and he never recovered from that. He never recovered from that and he never was the same and he wound up having dementia and then dying from Alzheimer's. And if you can imagine in prison, going through everything I was going through and then a guard just coming to your cell and just yelling out to you, your dad died and then just walking away. Don't, these are the things that I experienced mm. in prison. And you were very close to your father, right? I was extremely close to my father because my dad was a musician, uh, as, uh, as am I. And um, uh, when I was a kid, I was in shadow sitting on the piano and the organ and I get my love for music um, from him. He was a, a outstanding um, uh, singer and uh, piano and organ player, played all over the city, played for a lot of um, notable um, people. Yeah, Philly's uh, brought us so many great musicians, so many great musicians. Uh, how are you, as you're going through this 25 years, how are you able to, and I always ask this question because I, I'm such an impatient person. How are you just getting by day by day? Like, how are you surviving? How does, how does you, how are you getting by in this kind of trauma and you're innocent? How are you as a young man doing this 25, 30, 35? Like how, how did you do it? So for me, it's something to be in prison and then having the guards and the prisoners all trying to kill you and everybody hates you. And after the incident, um, after the incident of uh, me being jumped and so on and so forth, I just had a moment where I literally broke down and I just decided to fight back. I started writing every organization in this country for help. I wrote uh, James, Reverend James McClowski, Centrinian Ministries in New York, I mean in New Jersey, but I understood and knew that they had a waiting list and there was other innocent people in front of me and I couldn't wait. So I went about uh, creating the Justice for Jimmy campaign and fighting and I got on the internet and spread the truth and it, uh, began to take on a life of his own where I got supporters all over the country, all over the world, and some notable famous people. And my faith and belief in God sustained me and kept me strong. And from the moment I was in prison, from the very first day I was in prison, there was this gospel song that I used to sing by the whiners called Trust in God. And because you didn't have music in prison, all I had was my mind. And I had this list of songs that would play in my mind. And if you listen to this list of songs in their proper order, and you sit back and listen to them, you'll know exactly what I was going through and how I got through and, and my faith and strength and character of believing and knowing that my dead truth is gonna come out. So the list of songs are Trusting God by the Winers, Dead Lord by John Coltrane, Christopher Ross, Christopher Cross Selling, Bruce Springsteen, Glory Days, Stevie Wonder, If It's Magic, mm. Whitney Houston, Why Does It Hurt So Bad, mm. and then Fleetwood Mac, Don't Stop. Mm. 
And after that, I would after I would listen to those songs in my mind, I would get up after I prayed, and I would work on the Jimmy Justice for Jimmy campaign, and I would send out uh uh and I would work on uh law. I turned the the uh cell into a a library, legal library. I had books of all kinds. If I knew that they had free free legal books somewhere, then I would write them. I would write Georgetown University for a Georgetown uh, Law Journal, which is a book that they print out almost every year with legal cases in it. And I devoured the law. I called it putting up AI numbers, Allen Iverson, where I would literally put 55 letters in the door of writing anybody who was an activist or organization for help. And I fought back and I never ever gave up. All about faith and belief in God that my mother and father had instilled in me ever since I was a kid and growing up in Abbey's Ford Projects and in North Philadelphia, you know, having that, you know, having that um, uh, experience growing up there, I knew that I could make it anywhere. And I knew that I could get through this horrible, horrific time and restore my family name back um, to what it should uh, should be. So I wanna talk about how your conviction is overturned, but what really blew my mind with your story, your conviction is overturned, you're exonerated, but you're forced to stay in jail because the state appealed your conviction. So you're thinking, okay, I'm thinking as I'm reading your story, Oh, conviction was overturned in 2017. No, it was years before that because the state fought back. Uh, tell, tell us about how your convictions overturned and you being forced to stay in even after you're exonerated. So on August 23rd, 2016, the second legal decision that I spoke about came down that is now president in this country and helps um, other innocent people come home all over the country by the third circuit. Uh, that's where they said it was a grave miscarriage of justice and recognized my innocence for the second time. So you would think I would, that I'm on my way home, but the district attorney's office, which is Seth Williams, who, who, who your listeners should know is another corrupt, evil person who is now out of prison, um, who, went, who went to prison six months after I was out. Um, he appealed and told my lawyers after only after, and this isn't very important, only after we were, we were, we had a new trial and we were basically um, on our way home. And then at the, at the 25th hour after the 2016 presidential election, my lawyers received a phone call saying that they were going to the US Supreme Court because they now knew that the court would be conservative um, with the person that was president um, and that they noted that being that the US Supreme Court has already said several times that they don't care if you're innocent as long as that they can deem that you had a fair trial, they could kill you. So mm. that's why they did that. And so if you can imagine, we were devastated. So. Um, once again, another corrupt district attorney and, and, and Seth Williams did that. Knowing that I was innocent, he did that, period. Uh, I got to ask you this. You had two, what is it called, date of executions? You yes. had two dates that you were supposed to be executed. Uh, right. Obviously, it didn't happen. But I got to ask you, how does it feel? How did you feel when you heard this is the date that you're supposed to die. Um, when they come to, when they come to the death row cell, you already watched by a multitude of cameras, but they call it putting you on phase two. A bunch of guards come to the cell, white shirts, uh, captains and lieutenants. They call it white shirts. Captains and lieutenants come to your cell. They take you out. They handcuff you. They process you all over again and take pictures. They put you on what they call phase two. 
and it's a holding cell where the cameras are literally directly into the cell on you 24 hours where guard sits outside. There's nothing in the cell. You basically uh, have no property in there and you're just waiting to die. And when they came to um, the cell that I was in um, and they came and got me, um, I felt um, it just felt like it was a nightmare, like it wasn't a, you know, like it wasn't true. Like this can't be happening to me. Like my life was on such a different trajectory and now they're about to execute me for something I didn't do. Um, I was scared. Um, I worried about my mother and my daughters more than I worried about myself. It's an emotional roller coaster that no human being should ever experience. I once um, heard a historian um, say that um, he said something to the effect that a man, a man is the only mammal that doesn't know when we're going to pass away. Something to that effect, you know, to actually know that this is the day that you're going to die for something you didn't do. Um, you never get over that. I've, I've never gotten over the fact that I was on death row and I literally um, barely survived two execution warrants. One of those execution warrants was close to my youngest daughter's birthday, who was born just a week after um, I was stolen away. So if you can imagine, um, I, I now suffer from PTSD panic and anxiety attacks, and I'm constantly trying to fight to be a, a similar to what I used to be. But my daughters have had it extremely harder than you can ever imagine. And um, I always say that my family suffered more than I, but um, it's, a, it's, a, it's an unimaginable suffering that no human being should ever experience um, in their life. Yeah, wow. So you uh, you fight. You have your lawyers. You fight. Your your case uh, is overturned. Um, I couldn't find this in your in your in your uh, your records, but uh, I'm sorry. And what I what I researched was there any kind of compensation? Not that that would change anything. That not that you know some money would make it all better. But was there any kind of financial compensation for 25 years of your life? No. If you look, if you look at the um, Philadelphia Magazine article that just came out January, February issue, um, feature story in Philadelphia Magazine. Um, we're in court right now. If you can imagine something like that, um, the city, um, um, we're in court right now and the city um, has been fighting um, tooth to nail not to do right, right by me, even That's... though they know even though they know that Roger King, even though you yourself and your listeners know that Roger King is a corrupt district attorney, just look up the Lex Street murder case in this city, you know, and you'll see. Just look up. You can go and look up Anthony Wright's lawsuit, Chester Hoffman lawsuit, and the lawsuit that I have filed and see every single case that Roger King and Detective Santiago and Jaskrimski have done this to. Um, uh, the city has appealed to the Third Circuit, and we're now waiting on a decision uh, from the Third Circuit. But this is um, them putting me through more hurt, more pain. Um, and all I want is a sense of justice. Um, if they literally would apologize to me, I wouldn't even care. And that's the truth of the matter. Um, but if but if you understood, literally understood what my mother and my two daughters and my family have went through and what to what I went through and what I still go through, I'm in therapy uh, no less than twice a week. Um, I'm on medication for PTSD. 
panic and, and anxiety attacks. I literally live my life in a bubble now because I don't want to go anywhere. I make sure that I have a GPS on my phone and wherever I go, there's cameras, so on and so forth. You know what I mean? Fearful because of what they've done to me. You know what I mean? You know, and I love this city. I love all the people of this city and everything about this city. But there is a pocket of corruption that has, has been passed down and the city chooses to ignore countless times after countless times, starting with these, these police officers are from the Frank Rizzo era. Everybody in this city know right. Frank Rizzo was corrupt and racist. That's right. Everybody know, everybody in this city know who Lynn Abraham is. And everybody in this city knows Roger King um, was a corrupt district attorney along with uh, the other people that I've mentioned. This is no secret. I'm not saying anything that is foreign foreign to you. I'm not speaking a different language that people can't understand. We all know this. So if you want to do right, right, and you want to make a change and you want to seem like you on the right track, then, then do the right thing by everybody. This is why it's so important for somebody like Larry Krasner and Patricia Cummings to stay in office. And this is why all of us need to go out and vote for Larry Krasner and not be fooled because the FOP has propped up other candidates of their mm -hmm. choosing that's not going to do right by, by the people. The people should want the right people to go to prison all the time. There's nothing wrong with that. But when you have corruption from police officers and district attorneys, they need to answer for that in the form of justice of them going to prison. They don't need to be working no more. They need to lose their pensions. They don't need to have cushy retirement jobs, so on and so forth. We need to call a space of spade, an ace of ace, and a jack of jack. That's the only way you're going to make the system better. That's the only way you're not going to have another Jimmy Dennis. Period. This, uh, Larry Krasner has been, for those who don't know, uh, the, the, the DA of Philly, he's been a godsend. He's done some amazing work. Uh, he's really tried to overturn the the demonic things that uh, that uh, Roger King did and so many others. Uh, I, I forgot her name. They called her the Queen of Death. Well, what's her name? The, uh, the 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 person who was above Roger King Lynn that did all Abraham. of Roger. Lynn this Abraham. woman, and Lynn she's still Abraham. around. I mean, she's retired, yeah. but she. Yeah. They called her the Queen of Death. Yeah. I mean, this yeah. is insanity. Understand, understand that Roger King kept kept death row souvenir paraphernalia in his office. This is a man that you want to admire. This is a man that is devastated and left in his wake that have destroyed families, my family and the Williams family with lies. This is, the, this is a man who has destroyed uh, Chester Hoffman and, and countless others' lives. This is the man that you want to admire and you want to defend of Roger King and these police officers, you can't defend the undefendable. Go and look up, for all your listeners, go and look up James Dennis, August, August, August 21st, 2013, legal opinions from the Third Circuit and the District Court, respectfully, read what they say. And, and you ask yourself, why am I still going through what I'm going through? Why is anybody who has come home still trying to seek some form of, of, of justice, right? Okay, why? It's wrong, it's wrong. And until we all lift our voices up in unison, it's going to continue to happen. Absolutely, that's why I'm covering these stories. Uh, these are just- And I appreciate yeah. you so much for doing this. Appreciate oh. everything you do. Appreciate Thank everything you. you do for the innocent com community. You are a godsend. Thank you very much.